a printed circuit board or a PCB, you know, using a, a short acronym, uh, is basically the interconnect for an electronic circuit. So it's the substrate that all the components are going to get mounted to, uh, and it also carries all the different electrical connections for all of those components. Once the components are mounted to the PCB, we have what we call a printed circuit board assembly or a PCBA. Uh, so all those electronics get mounted on there, typically using some type of solder, for instance, in order to electrically connect the components to the, the PCB itself. Pretty much any electronic component could get mounted to these boards. They also support ways of mechanically fixing these things inside of a chassis, for instance, too. You might have holes or whatever printed in, in the circuit board itself. The process of taking your PCB design and moving it into a mass production type scenario involves uh, for one, sourcing all the components and the PCB itself. So using a fabricator to get your PCB uh, manufactured uh, and then sourcing all your components. From that point, it's getting the entire assembly uh, completed, which means all the electronic components need to get mounted to the PCB or soldered uh, to the PCB. That typically involves putting the entire assembly, once the components are placed on it through a reflow oven, that causes the solder to melt and the components to get mounted. And then from there, typically it involves tests, make sure that the components can work, as well as doing visual inspections to ensure quality and reliability of the, the assembly. In-circuit testing is where the PCBA, so the printed circuit board assembly, can get verified that all the proper components have been installed. So the resistors, the capacitors, the integrated circuits uh, are all the proper ones and that uh, the impedances and resistances throughout the board are what you would expect. Uh, so that kind of gives, even before you power up the board, it gives you some uh, sense that everything has been populated properly, they're present and, and in their proper orientations as well. To produce tens of a, a circuit board, uh, there's a lot of rudimentary techniques that can be used. Uh, sometimes uh, some hobbyists might even etch their own boards just from a copper clad type board. Uh, there's also some you know, printer type tools that, that could route the connections. Uh, and those are fine for you know, very low uh, layer count type PCBs and simple circuits. Uh, and then as you, you know, once you start looking at mounting the components to it, there's even some people that use toaster ovens right, to mount the solder and get them on there. Or you could solder them by hand, which is probably the most simplistic. And, and that's usually sufficient at tens. Uh, as you start to scale up in volume, of course, that becomes much, much more difficult. It's really starting to think less about the functionality of your circuit and just making it work. Uh, you start looking at, okay, now that uh, a PCB fabricator needs to make this PCB, how do I make it simpler for them to do that and do it reliably? So, uh, you know, building 10, doesn't you don't necessarily need to be reliable in that process or build a high quality product, it just needs to function. As you start to scale in volume, you tend to focus more and more on that to keep your costs low. So you might consider things like uh, uh, acid traps in your PCB where you have like acute angles on your traces. You could end up with uh, acid ended up getting trapped in some of those and, uh, and can cause reliability issues where traces can disconnect, for instance. Uh, looking at how your traces run into vias. Uh, there's some techniques there to make sure that they're strengthened, especially if you're doing like through hole components too. Uh, so there's different considerations like that, as well as, you know, once you start looking at, uh, you know, design for test and putting hooks into place on the PCB for those types of things as well. So there's, there's quite a few things that you wouldn't, wouldn't even really think of on a low volume type PCB, but you need to consider, especially as you scale in volume. As you start to scale up in the larger quantities, getting up into you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of types of boards, you're gonna really start to focus on yield. So from a PCB perspective, also from a PCBA perspective. So when you look at, for instance, an assembly house and mounting these components onto the boards, uh, they need to be able to do that very reliably, do it very repeatably. Uh, you know, if there's situations where a component might fall off a board because you got you know, a heavy component next to a light component, uh, those things really start to become significant as you scale in volume. So one tip for you know, a, a junior designer uh, would be trust your design rule checker. So your DRC checker and your tools, so, you know, depending on what tool set you're using, they all pretty much have them. Uh, you really need to take the time to set that up properly before you begin your design. So make sure you load all the appropriate rules for your clearances, your, your track widths, put in as much details as possible and then trust the feedback that it's giving you. When you design a PCB, what most people tend to do is use the minimal 
minimal size drills, minimal traces, minimal clearances, mm -hmm. when you actually, in fact, don't need them, mm -hmm. right? So you should be designing to what you actually require, not to the minimum manufacturing standard that a fabricator has, gotcha. because that's at the edge of where they can build yes. those boards reliably, gotcha. right? So you know, if you can get away with 10 mil traces, then you should be using 10 mil traces, not five mil traces, right? To bring the reliability and, and the quality of the PCB up. My name is Chris Cooper. I work for Avnet Electronics Marketing. I'm the uh, technical director for emerging businesses.